Each 12-storey block stands over 100 feet high. Owned by the housing executive, the concrete structures are at the centre of one of the most deprived wards in the UK. About 500 people live here, in conditions that many say are unacceptable. Over the next half hour, you'll hear their stories, the difficulties they faced, and how they fought to raise their basic living standards. I'm on my way to them with a woman who's been campaigning on behalf of the people living there for more than 25 years. You should never get over the outrage of the anger of people living in these conditions. Trade unionist Inez McCormick knows all about living in the towers. Every time I come back, I mean, I remember I have to tell you these As we drive through the new lodge, she explains how the plight of the residents moves her as much today as it did when she first got involved. We're looking at this um, concrete um, jungle surrounding them. I'm looking straight in front of me at uh, uh, a block of thatch with side windows where, where clothes are hung on the landings. That's the only place to keep them dry because the water inside the walls rolls down. That's also the only place for children to play. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm looking around where in anybody's terms, um, how do you live up there if you've got kids mm-hmm. and let them play down here? There's nothing about the quality of life for children which is why there's so much illness here. So I'm seeing that as a first glimpse. I'll tell you what, let's get out and have a walk around, shall we? OK. okay. Inez doesn't have to go far before she meets some friends. You couldn't come in here without somebody seeing you, could you? <laughs> as long as I don't get... Oh, that's right. She's a familiar face around the towers and knows the problems that people here have. I've come down to hear for myself the difficulties they face. So I'm going inside to meet Adele. She lives on the 8th floor of a block called Maeve House. Adele lives here with her one-year-old son, James. Her flat is one of many in the towers, which have problems that the tenants say are caused by persistent damp. We're in uh, what should be my bedroom, which I can't really use. It's The ceiling's completely there and the corner's covered in water. There's water drops dropping off it. And the, the beads of water are, are just hanging there. Yeah, they just hang and then they just drip and drip and hit, hit the PVC skirting board. I mean, if you come, to, if you come down here, I mean... It's definitely, it's, it's mouldy and it, it just smells damp to me and it's, I, I can't even describe it, it's just pure black and it's growing up the wall and it's actually coming down from the ceiling as well. In the other bedroom, that's where it's worst. Adele takes me in and shows me what else the damp is affecting. The likes of here and here. Just tell us what that is. Then. It's mould on the child's toys, that, that, you know, the damp and stuff. Now we're, we're looking at a little um, little toy dinosaur. and yeah. uh, and there's another one there that's actually worse. Right, so the, the, these little toy dinosaurs actually have black mold spots yeah. of, of mould on them. Uh-huh. I hear Adele's story repeated by other mums. Bridget has three children, all under the age of three. She shows me her worst affected room, the room where she says the whole family have to sleep. Damp, black, it's all fungus, and all the water in the windows. The windows be open every day. This is where your child sleeps. All sleep. All of you. Yeah. There's a, a double bed, and there's a cot, and there's another bed. How many? How many of you sleep in here? Me and the three kids. And this is the room with the green mould on the window? Yes. Sure, like the water drips down under the kids' bed as well. So it's not really a place for the kids to sleep. Bridget will have been living in her flat for four years this May. She's on the third floor. I met one family, though, who live on the 10th. The Demertas family are one of only four still living in the upper levels. Mum and Dad, Jackie and Yavus, have been living in the towers for six years. They have a five-year-old son. Once again, I'm invited in to see the problems they face. I can show you if you want to come. You can see all the moulds. Jackie says that living on the 10th floor and the restrictions that brings has a major effect on her son. I think he's, he feels like a prisoner. I really do. And I feel bad for him at times because when I'm bringing him in, he says, oh, I'm going in here and I can't get out. Now, he did, on numerous occasions, he has been saying, Mommy, I want to bring my friend, but we need a house with a garden so I can play with my friends. I ain't going up here and I'm not coming out again. Conditions for young families in these towers are tough, but parents like Jackie and Yavas say they don't have much of a choice. 
They've been offered alternatives by the housing executive, but they say those aren't suitable either. Jackie brings me outside into the landing between the flats to show me where her son plays. It's cold and there's not a lot of room. I can see his little bike there, just out there. Right, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's not a big space no, to cycle no, around. No, and he just cycles up and down here because with my hours of work, I can't get out to take him because sometimes I'm only coming home and an hour later I'm going straight out again. So he just cycles up and down. Yeah. And we don't like him going out too often with Andy. Andy's not well. And the other Angie neighbors. lives across the landing from Jackie. She's lived in the Tars for over two decades. And I meet her coming into the flats the next day. Good morning. This is our county. Uh-huh. Born in County Mayo, Angie was brought up in England and has lived all over the world. Now, a flat on the 10th floor of Maeve House is where she calls home. We're in my hallway now. It's a bit dark and grim looking. But She's a pensioner with the health problems that can come with older age. But she says that what really affects her quality of life are the grim conditions she's living in. The ceiling is just flaking away. Oh, goodness, yeah. Um, that's that's the uh, the kitchen again with the frames round the windows. They they can be pulled away from the. Um, I do get a bit scared opening that window in case it. Does. Chatting in her living room, there's more evidence of what she's dealing with. You sat in my p- place at the moment, which is badly needs decorating, but I'm not throwing money on a place that's literally coming down on me. You see, I've got a little heater there on because these will turn off pretty soon. And what temperature you've built up during the day goes because they don't come back on. We're in the 21st century. We're living in flats that were built over 40 years ago. Um, Surely there's some form of heating that can go in high-rise flats that would be effective and affordable. That's inside the flat. Outside on her landing, Angie has to deal with waste left by pigeons, which gather where she's supposed to dry her clothes. Over the years, this has been a major problem in the flats. The housing executives say they've almost eliminated it, but in some areas, it's still happening. Right, well, in here is where you put your... You're supposed to hang your washing. All right, yeah. All around me here I can see pigeon feathers and, you know, there's no nice way of saying it, pigeon poo. Uh Aha. You see, because there's nothing to stop. They're roosting. They can come straight in. If I walk over to the edge here, we can see some railings here and I I can literally scrape with my fingers and and there's pigeon feathers. There's... (laughs) Pigeon poo all, all, all over this. Uh-huh. Yeah, so that after you've spent money on your washing powder and running your washing machine, you bring your clean washing to dry in here. As you can see, nobody uses them. I'm Kieran Tracy, and this is the story of the people who live in the Seven Towers flats in Belfast's New Lodge. Outside, I meet two young mothers, Roisin and Shawnee. They used to live in the Towers. They had their children there, but they've since been rehoused. Shanine says that apart from the problems inside the flats, there were problems outside too. It was hard because they were always looking out, wanting to go out and play, and you couldn't let them out because you you couldn't watch them and you couldn't let them down outside the front to play because there was nowhere for them to go and you were scared because they never grew up. They were always locked in, so they had no sense of the road or anything, so we were always worried. And then they were depressing you because they, they were crying to get out and then you felt sorry for them because they couldn't get out, so it was really, really hard. Like. I've heard a lot about the poor physical conditions that people here have to deal with. They've talked about the damp, the cold, the pigeon waste and the lack of space for their children. Some people, though, are happy enough to stay here. But for others, this isolating high-rise environment is taking a heavy toll on their mental and emotional well-being. I just keep myself to myself in them. But they're all right to live in, like, because I have nowhere else to go, so I have to stay there. Jared lives in Coo Holland House, and hasn't been there long. He says he's on medication for depression. Since I've been here, I've heard over and over again that vulnerable people should not be placed in the towers. I think you just get lonely sitting there on your own after a while. Whenever everybody goes home, 
Because I take medication and stuff and I can't. I get depressed and all sitting there on my own. What, what is it about the tars that does that to you? 